Right, so in this video I'm going to discuss and expand upon a couple concepts and things that are pretty clear and apparent when looking at our modern cosmology and then the derivative, say, spiritual practices or approaches to uh, self-improvement that originate from that place. And generally we can usually see pretty uh, two pretty obvious qualities. Uh, one being dominance and the other being generic. And I think these are fundamentally based on misunderstandings and these are fundamental distortions that aren't really based on actually observing our life as it is, uh, based in not observing the natural world as it is, and instead based on uh, probably possession <laughs> of some fashion uh, or basically um, indicative of a real disempowered state of being that these type of concepts then plug into and sort of feed off of. Now, dominance basically um, shows up uh, in a few different ways. There's obviously dominating something and then also being dominated by something. That's one aspect. The other aspect is obviously subservience, being a servant, being below, or subsequently being addicted to power and control and trying to have people below you that you can then control and manipulate. And I think this is a really easy one to see within modern culture because usually the more dominant uh, you are and a bit more manipulative, in some ways you're rewarded for that. And I've, there's a lot of articles uh, and things, at least from the modern scientific con uh, context, which say that basically if you have psych psychopathic and sociopathic tendencies, you're typically more likely to succeed uh, within the modern world, and especially the corporate world, because it's really constructed for that. And then the education system is usually based on these type of principles as well, generally teaching you what to think, not how to think, uh, and generally giving you very limited and distorted perceptions of what history is, cosmology is, philosophi is. And the thing is, if you're raised in such deep, deep limitation and poverty, then you really n never know the difference. Uh, and then, obviously a great example of that is just like the whole concept of monotheism. There's this being up here that you know created everything and did everything, and we're basically here to uh, follow the rules and hopefully get a good judgment and then get to go to a better place next time. Subsequently, people also tend to interpret karma in the same way, whereas we could say that basically within the concept of monotheism, there's God, this higher being who is basically functioning as this all-seeing eye kind of judgmental force within the universe, which is relying upon this established idea or this belief in this ultimate kind of morality or this type of embedded morality or good badness within our experience. So then if we're a good person and do good things, then we'll get the good rewards. If we're bad, then we get the punishment. But God is basically watching over us and sees us. And then when it's you know our time, then judgment is passed uh, based on whatever rules and different things that we're defining. That's one, that's kind of the basic mechanics of it. Yeah, people usually will be like, oh, that's not really into that, but karma, oh, that makes sense. And then generally what people do is just change the words and the verbiage around, but interpret karma as the same way. Like, oh, well, I'm just here. I incarnated because I have to like purify all my bad karma. Uh, and, you know, if, if I do bad things then I'm gonna have to deal with that, but if I do good things then that's gonna be better. And the real, the real assumption there is the same assumption as for monotheism within that there's this invisible judgmental force at play in the cosmos that's, you know, watching over us and sort of keeping track and keeping a tally of us, which again has really nothing to do with the actual concept of karma from the lineages uh, that used it, which is traditionally a Hindu or an Indian uh, philosophical concept, which was then adopted um, through Buddhism because Buddhism was uh, Hinduism in a sense stripped down. They took some mechanics from there and then Chinese philosophy borrowed from it a little bit, but rarely has anyone ever actually understood it because they're conditioned from this one perspective and they hear something that sounds vaguely familiar but 
just exotic enough and just sort of depersonalized enough that it's uh you know it'll it'll fit the bill so to speak and this is gets to the second dynamic that i was pointing out earlier after we're talking about you know the whole dominance and being dominated or dominating something or the subsequent belief in the value of subservience and hierarchy and the, these types of uh thinking uh and then i'm pouring some tea at, at the moment so if you hear you know some sounds and fidgeting that's what that is uh, and then the other concept is just basically this idea of a, a generic spirituality, a generic path, meaning here's the rules. Here's a couple concepts. If you believe in them and you do them, then you'll somehow maybe magically get the carrot. Uh, when in actuality, that's basically the same fundamental constructs, the same mechanics as the generic monotheism that we're supposedly trying to be an alternative to. Uh, so that we have to actually maybe get in touch with that and see if that's really a thing. Uh, or if we're just repeating the same thing that we were before, but under a different guise, which is a deeper level of delusion, which is likely to not necessarily succeed. When in actuality, usually uh, within authentic traditions, uh, there really wasn't a such thing as a generic path. There was no no real such thing as a generic path. And one example of this, which we can understand, is uh, there's all these ideas uh, in this sort of romantic, sort of superstitious, uh, vague idea of, oh, you know, the monks were like living up in the mountains and hermits, you know, they decided, they got up one day and they're like, you know what, I'm going to cast off this world. And I'm just going to go up in the mountains and then, you know, have an attainment of some fashion. Uh, that's actually not really the case. Uh, that's uh, definitely and massively a, like a modern Western type of romantic fairy tale, uh, which has really nothing to do. And it's all, again, based on this whole dominance thing and this whole thing of like a generic uh, sort of spirituality. Um, a side note to that is just looking at people think, uh, you know, oh, if you're just compassionate and you're nice and you're loving, you know, that's, that's the underlying spirituality for all humans. It's like, well, yes, but have you perhaps understood that, let's say I'm an American living in this generation. So the emotions that I have and the feelings that I have and the way I see the world are different than even the generation before me and the generation before me. Uh, and I have things that they don't have and they had things that I don't have. So for me to use these words, we probably are going to mean different things. That's just a couple generations in America. Let's not even assume a thousand years. Uh, and I'm, you know, in America, this is a person maybe in Tibet, maybe in China, maybe in India, maybe a time before those places were even named as such. Completely different language, completely different state of the planet. And then maybe what they meant by those words is also completely different because emotions and feelings in, in a lot of ways are inherently cultural and they're very relative to certain times and places. They're not necessarily so universal as we would believe because that is again really generic and really small-minded. Uh, so getting back to the point is like usually what happened is you would be in a specific lineage because you would have demonstrated that you have a knack for it, you have an interest for it, you have some propensity for it you're actually good at it. So, okay. So the teacher's like, well, okay, well, here's what I think you should do. You seem to have these astrological things going on, these factors going on, uh, these inclinations, these talents. Uh, so what I'm going to do is write out this map for you and write out this thing. And then you should go to this mountain or you should go to this particular cave because it's actually a really good fit for you based on all the geomantic forces, astrological forces, and then basically you'll be able to really do work there based on what that environment is and based on what you have going on, based on what you're trying to achieve and based on the space and the time and a whole host of complex factors and calculations. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm gonna cast off the world and just sit around all day and then hope that lightning strikes. It's like, no, you're gonna engage in a very specific thing. Uh, and that's generally oftentimes more closer to how things actually functioned. In the stories of 
uh, it's some of the most famous monks in history. That's kind of how it is, like uh, Milarepa. I think I'm saying the name right. Uh, one of the most famous uh, Buddhist monks. Basically, basically, he was just an average, pretty mediocre monk. And he happened to have a connection with another guy who was a bit of a da Vinci, a bit of a genius as far as understanding these calculations. He was like, hey, you should go to this mountain at this particular time and under these circumstances and do these things. And then I think something will really happen. And then, boom. And that's also even this chart behind me. Like, we might look at it like, oh, that's cute. It looks like some cool, like, you know, symbolism and stuff or cool whatever. But the amount of complexity and stuff that goes into that is ex incredibly profound. And it's actually a bit of a calendar, a bit of a, a, a way to calculate when and where and how to do certain practices, uh, which is just indicating a tremendous amount of depth and specificity. Because in the West, there's, we, things are just very generic. Like, oh, I just need to turn myself over to this guru or this system or this practice or this thing and get rid of all of myself and get rid of all of my possessions and turn myself over and just hope that if I just be nice and compassionate or just calm my mind for 20 minutes a day or do A, B, C, D or whatever, then maybe I'll have something magical happen and I don't know. And it's like, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I mean nothing at all and I'm not here to say you should or shouldn't do something I'm here saying something a bit more specific and talking about very specific and clear dynamics to hopefully illustrate a larger uh, and a bit more of a realistic type of context because it, it's just it just boggles my mind if you were going to undertake any other endeavor in human life we wouldn't even be having this conversation you'd be like if I want to be a really amazing chef you're not just gonna read a couple of books and like eat and eat food twice a day and think you're gonna become an amazing chef. No, there's a lot to it. There's a whole lot to it. And let's say maybe you think you wanna be a chef, but you might be terrible at it. You might have no inclination, no talent for it whatsoever. And you might just be fighting an uphill battle the entire time. Maybe you have more of an inclination to be an auto mechanic or be a bonsai, gardening enthusiast or something else that you're just a bit more have an actual inclination and an actual inherent knack for rather than deciding one day oh that sounds amazing I think I should do that there's just there's just nothing behind that there's nothing there other than just pure like delusion or some sort of possession uh, which again just trying to illustrate these dynamics of this whole obsession with dominance and the tributaries that come from that and the whole obsession with generic vague sort of spirituality uh, and this is just also uh, indicative of, of when people really will hide behind oh you just can't talk about it oh you just can't put it into words it's like well you did just talk about it you did just put it into words but you're just trying to put up a wall because there's nothing there there's no substance there's nothing for you to actually talk about or describe because otherwise you could. Uh, that's one thing where people will hide behind. Oh, it's everything's empty and everything's nothing, or everything's perfect, or you know, it's it's a uh, everything's a conceptual condition of the mind, and we just don't need concepts, and we just let the concepts go, and everyone will be fine. It's like, well, that might make sense at a certain level for certain people, but I can almost guarantee with absolute certainty that you're not there. Uh, otherwise, we probably wouldn't be engaged in the conversation. But the fact that we are, and then you are, so it means it probably isn't. And that just also gets to be part of this generic obsession. People don't understand there's a sequence, there's a certain stage of events, there's a certain, uh, I mean, what the fuck is a lineage or a system otherwise, other than that, a certain process, a certain path. Not just like, oh bro, just surrender, it'll, it'll all be good. Like, no, that's not really how it is. So if you have no idea and it's a vague sense of generality, then that's probably all you have is a vague sense of generality. Uh, or if a practice relies highly on faith, belief, imagination, or um, you know, or imagination, then it's probably imaginary. Like 
but it's it's for some reason this makes people really uptight and uncomfortable if you apply it to spirituality or religion that's because for so long there's been uh, a, a distinct effort to keep people disempowered so how you do that is you tell people oh you can't understand it oh it's far away oh it's this oh it's that and you put all of these layers and then make them feel subservient so they will all they'll eventually just take that on and basically be their own keep themselves in slavitude and keep themselves disempowered in forever just fumbling in the dark uh, and that's fairly easy to, to look at and see as being historically kind of the case most of the time. Which is actually nothing wrong with that. Because just because we think we deserve a certain practice or a certain attainment doesn't mean that we do actually. Uh, because believe it or not, life isn't really that politically correct. Uh, and and deep, more deeply at a, an energetic level, life really doesn't give a shit about us. I mean, in, in, in the self-obsessed self -obsessed sense of being highly human-centric and egocentric and hierarchical, because the cosmos is providing equally for basically everything all the time, but for some reason we created these fake ideas of, oh, well, spirituality and religion, this is like the highest aspect of you know, human life, so we gotta treat that differently, we gotta speak in hushed tones, we can't talk about it, we can't do this, we can't do that. Uh, somehow like this is just reflective of our own egocentricity so it's like we're trying to be humble but at the same time everything we're trying to do that by is deeply embedded with just the opposite of humility because the word humility goes back to the root of the word H-U-M uh, which is, has ties with the word humus which is basically referring back to being of the earth and understanding this and actually seeing this for a bit what it is because uh, basically I mean, the universe is providing the things for everything all the time and responding to everything all the time. It's just for some reason, because we're humans, we think we're somehow special or above it because we invented an idea of God that's somehow above us and so we're trying to be like God, so we're just trying to basically imitate something rather than developing any type of responsibility, understanding, awareness, whatever. Anyways, hopefully this makes sense, some food for thought, and I'll talk to you soon.